When you learned how to play Dungeons & Dragons, someone taught you the rules of combat and probably left it at that. Today, we're going to go back to school and learn some battle basics. There are a lot of rules in Dungeons & Dragons, especially when it comes to combat. And combat is where the system really shines, is unique, and there's a ton of things to remember. Now, the basics are easy. What to do on your turn, you can move, you can attack, you have, maybe have a bonus action, but it's not just to know what you can do in a round of combat. Think about it like this. Think about chess. If someone just taught you what all the pieces did, and that's where they stopped, you're never going to get good at the game. You're never going to become a grandmaster. But if someone stops and teaches you the strategies around these moves and these pieces, you're going to get a whole lot better. Let me introduce you to a concept called the action economy. Now, in a game like Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, generally speaking, the side that has the most actions is going to win, especially at low level. So the more things that you can do to give your side more actions and the other side less actions is going to tip the scales in your favor. Imagine it this way. Each side has the same number of people, the same number of actions, and are going to do about the same amount of damage. If you just go back and forth taking turns, who wins is really a roll of the dice. But if you take away one of these people, now one side has more actions than the other. And it's going to be more likely that they're going to hit more often, do more damage, and win the day. So the action economy is the big idea that we're going to focus on in this video. And everything else I talk about is going to be relating back to that idea that if you can get more actions, you're going to win versus the other side. You could even win even if the other side is stronger, tougher, and does more damage than you do. So keep that idea in mind, the action economy. So let me pose a question to you. What does more damage? An enemy with full hit points or an enemy with one hit point? Now, unless there's some kind of really weird special ability they have, it's going to be obviously they do the same amount of damage. So the idea here is that you want to stack your damage, not spread your damage out. It's really easy in the heat of combat to lose focus and start attacking whoever's right in front of you or the person that just insulted your character. But you need to stay focused. You need to start stacking damage upon damage onto a single foe until they're dealt with. Imagine this. What would happen if two or three or four members of your party all wailed on one foe in a single round until they dropped? The next turn, there's gonna be one last person to deal with, one last person to take actions for the opposing side, and then you can rinse and repeat and do that all over again. This is gonna move you towards your general goal of tipping the action economy in your favor and your specific goal of ending or winning the combat scenario. As an ancillary idea to this one too, always go for the spellcasters first. Spellcasters are amazing, whether they're a cleric, a sorcerer, or a wizard, it doesn't really matter because their magic has the ability to change the tide of battle. They can change the shape of the environment you're in with spells like Fog Cloud or Wall of Fire. They can actually bring back another foe that you've already gotten rid of with a healing spell. Kill the casters first. Rarely do fights happen just on an empty field or a plain plane, if you will. Usually they're gonna be taking place someplace interesting, like a forest or a tavern or a dungeon complex. You wanna use that environment to your advantage. Think about medieval castles. They had all these great features that helped them to defend against attackers. They had curtain walls where they could still volley arrows and boulders and whatnot at the foes before they could actually get to them. They had arrow slits, so archers had unimpeded access to their targets while they were mostly covered. And they had narrow hallways. So they could group in attackers so that only so many people could attack at once. And that my favorite feature, they had these really cool clockwise staircases that would curve up. And they were always clockwise because it put the attackers who were ascending at a disadvantage. The right hand with the sword typically is gonna be hitting this weird curved wall where they're trying to strike. 
while the defenders who were going to be going up backwards on those stairs had a beautiful curved wall that went with their swing and this kind of weird half wall on the left hand side that gave them partial cover. In D&D 5th edition, in combat, you want to find scenarios just like this. A fight breaks out in a tavern, go hide behind the bar and shoot arrows and duck down behind it. You have tons of guys coming down the hallway, stop that hallway. Make sure they don't get past you because only one or two foes can hit you while the rest are in queue in line waiting their turn doing nothing, further tipping the action economy in your favor. Two little sub points about the environment. One, don't forget to use cover. Cover is great. Half cover gives you a plus two to your AC and your saving throws. And three-fourths cover is going to give you a plus five to those AC and saving throws. They're, it's amazing and you can find cover almost anywhere. A little addendum here, casters are great when it comes to the environment. They can literally change the shape of environments or create their own environments with things like blade barrier and wall of fire and thorn growth. That way you can put your enemies into these little funnels they have to get through or keep them from approaching your ranged attackers. Make sure you're using those buff spells to help the overall battle, not just fireball, as much fun as it is to decimate the battlefield. Advantage is one of the unsung heroes of the 5th edition system. Advantage is great because it always feels good to get to roll 2d20 and take the better one. But there's something happening mechanically here too. It's like a little extra action hid inside the real action. You're getting the chance to see two possible scenarios, two alternate realities, and pick the best one. And so even though it's only one action, it's like you got to take two but pick the best one. It's like temporary hit points on top of your real hit points. It's temporary actions on top of your real actions. It's pretty great. And so what that means is, is that if your table does flanking, it's an optional rule, so talk to your DM. You probably already know if you do it or not. Flanking lets you have advantage on all your attacks. In fact, it lets lots of people have advantage on your attacks. So get with a buddy, someone who works well with your character and flank a foe. Have you flanked a foe today? This is gonna give you advantage for both you and your friend as the focus of this bad guy is now split and he has to contend with two different targets that are kind of on the opposite sides of him. A little addendum about flanking. If you can flank, so can your enemies. So make sure you're watching your environment, that you're not letting yourself get surrounded unless you have a really good plan for when that happens. Thunderstep. Lastly are what I like to call the two big P's of combat. There's prone and pushed. When you take the action during combat, there's actually way more things than you can do other than just attack. There's like 11 of them. It's a huge list. Two that are really important are the push or the shove action that you can take. You can actually push a foe and they can either be pushed back five feet or be knocked prone. It's just athletics check versus their athletics or acrobatics check, their choice. The push or shove action is great because you can either push them five feet, maybe into say a cliff or a waterfall or burning coals. It's really great. Or you can push them prone, which gets into the second big P, prone. The prone condition is excellent because when they're on the ground, everyone who does a melee attack is going to get advantage. And if you have extra attack, this is especially great because you can choose to replace one of those attacks with a shove or a push. And it doesn't use up the whole action. So you can push a character to prone and then hit them with the other attacks. Now that might be good if you have lots of extra attacks, but it's especially good early on when you're doing it with a friend. You can have someone else with you. Now they can wail them while they're on the ground, especially if they're like a, you know, a roguey type person, you know what I'm talking about. And even if you choose not to stick around while they're on the ground, it's going to take half their movement to get back up again. And if you've already left, now they have to come to you, perhaps through now a new magical wall that's going to do them damage or give your archers a chance to shoot them at distance and maybe they'll drop them for good and they'll never have a chance to come attack you again. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed these little tips for battle basics. Uh, leave a comment in the comments below. I'd love to hear your thoughts or other strategies you have used at your table. Thanks so much for watching and uh, like and subscribe.